Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Sarazzle Dazzle Physics. In today's session guys, we're going to be doing a full GCSE Physics Pass paper. Today I'm going to be doing AQA GCSE Physics Higher Tier Paper 1 2020. Make sure you try the paper yourself and you only use this video to check my working and you see what my thinking process is. Okay, so let's get straight into the questions. Question 1. A student investigated how the current in the filament lamp varied with the potential difference across the filament lamp. Figure 1 shows part of the circuit used. Complete figure 1 by adding an ammeter and voltmeter. Use the correct circuit symbols. Right, so for the ammeter, I need to place it in series with the bulb. So here's my ammeter. And there you go, it's a circle with a capital A. And for the voltmeter, don't forget the voltmeter is connected around the component under test. Because I'm going to be testing the filament bulb here, I place it around this component over here. So it's a circle and a V for the voltage. And that's going to be my uh, symbol for the voltmeter. And that is three marks. Figure two shows some of the results. Okay, so here we have a graph of current on the y-axis, potential difference on the x-axis, and we can see it goes up over here. Um, then the question is going to be asking me, um, the student reversed the connections to the power supply and obtained negative values for the current and potential difference. Draw a line on figure two to show the relationship between the negative values of the current and potential difference. Right, hopefully you can remember that for a filament lamp, the current voltage graph looks like this. Um, that's this. You should have covered this in the course like an S shape over here, an S shape here. So I'm just going to continue this line in this quadrant over here, over here. Hopefully you can remember that the filament lamp, it doesn't matter which way around it is in a circuit, you still get the same shape. But obviously we're going to reverse it for this axis over here. Okay, so I'm going to pick a point, let's go for 4, 0 0.2. There we go, this point over here, we can then go through it on this side, so 4, 0 0.2 over there. And obviously we're going to mirror this shape, so we're going to go like this over there. Obviously you're going to draw it with much more care than I am. I'm drawing it on the screen here. And that's two marks available. 1.3, write down the equation which links current potential difference and resistance. So that's going to be V is equal to I times by R. Determine the resistance of the filament lamp when the potential difference across it is one volt. Use data from figure two. Right, so first of all we know that R is equal to V divided by I, rearranging it. The voltage is 1.0 volts divided by the current. So I'm going to read off the current value from that graph. So when it's 1 volt over here, the current is going to be 0.08. So look, when it's 1 volt over here, it is 0.08 over here. Let's chuck that into the formula over here. So it's going to be 1 divided by 0.08. Our answer is going to be 12.5 ohms. There we go. That's an easy question. 1.5. A second student did the same investigation. The ammeter had a zero error. What is meant by zero error? Right, so let's just say I have the ammeter right now uh, over here and it's not connected to anything. Surely the ammeter reading should be zero right now. But let's say if you had the ammeter and it wasn't connected to anything and it was getting a reading of 0.01. This is a zero error because it is not reading zero when it should do. So we can put that down here. Ammeter is displaying a reading when not connected to the circuit. So it should read zero, but it's not. So that's the reason why it has a zero error. Question two, figure three shows an LED torch. The torch contains one LED, one switch, and three cells. Which diagram shows the correct circuit for the torch? Okay, so which one is it? So the diode, uh, it actually matters which way the current is flowing through it. If you have forgotten, guys, let's just talk about diodes. So let's say the diode is like this. And if I have it uh, the other way around, so the there we go, let's put it this way. Right, so which of these diodes lights up? It's going to be the first one. Why? Because the current goes from positive to negative, and look, it can flow through the diode. So this one will work. This one, it doesn't work because this is the positive terminal, and look, the current can't pass through it. So it clashes over here. So obviously it's about the polarity of the cell here. So this one uh, won't work. These two are in the opposite direction. These ones are in the wrong direction and won't work. It's going to be this one over here. So it's going to be this one because look, it goes from the positive all the way around over here. 2.2, write down the equation which links charge flow, current and time. Q is equal to I times by T. Charge it, yes. Uh, next one, um, the torch worked for 14,400 uh, seconds before the cells need replacings. The current is 50 milliamps. Calculate total charge. Q is equal to I times by T, right, um, 50 milliamps, you must convert to amps. 50 milliamps is the same as 50 times by 10 to the minus 3 amps over here. So it's going to be 50 times by 10 to the minus 3 amps times by the time, 144000. So therefore, I'm going to get the value of 720 coulombs, 720 coulombs. 
2.4, when replaced, the cells were put into the torch the wrong way around. Explain why the torch did not work. So explain why the torch did not work. So when they put it back, they put it the wrong way around. So it looks like this. So they, I'm just going to redraw what they've done. So it's going this way around. So why didn't the LED light up? Why didn't the LED light up? It's because um, the current will go this way and obviously it won't be able to flow through the diode. So the first point is going to be current is unable to flow through diode. And the reason why is because that diode has a very high resistance in this direction because diode, there we go guys, because the diode has high resistance in this direction. So that's the reason why it won't work. 2.5, write down the equation which links efficiency, total power input and useful power output. Right, so efficiency is equal to useful power out divided by total power in. Good, so the efficiency, guys, is going to be used with that formula. The total power input to the LED was 0.24 watts. The efficiency of the LED is 0.75. Calculate the useful power output of the LED. Right, so uh, which efficiency is equal to useful power out divided by total power in. Now rearranging it, we know that the useful power out, so useful power out is going to be equal to the efficiency times by total power in. So the efficiency is going to be 0.75 times by uh, total power in, 0.24. I'm getting the answer of 0.18 watts, everyone. So 0.18 watts is my answer. That's three marks. Figure three shows a hydroelectric power station. The electricity generated when water from the reservoir flows through the turbines. Write down the equation which links density, mass, and volume. Right, density is equal to mass divided by volume. Uh, the reservoir stores uh, 6,500,000 meters cubed of water. The density of the water is 998 kilogram per meter cubed. Calculate the mass of the water in the reservoir. Give your answer over here. So first of all, density is equal to mass divided by volume. Therefore, mass is equal to density times by volume. The mass is equal to the density 998 times by the volume of the water. 6500000. So the mass is going to be equal to uh, 6.487 times by 10 to the power of 9, everyone. There we go, guys. And look, it's already in standard form. 6.487 times by 10 to the power of 9. That's going to be the mass here. 3.3, write down the equation which links energy, transferred, power, and time. Energy is equal to power times by time. Electrical generators provide 1.5 times by 10 to the power of 9 watts of power for a maximum of 5 hours. Calculate the maximum energy. E is equal to P times by T. So the power is going to be 1.5 times by 10 to the power of 9 times by the time. The time taken, we must convert 5 hours into seconds. So we have 5 hours. That's going to be equal to 5 hours times by 60, because that's how many minutes there are. And times by 60 again will tell me the number of seconds. I'm going to get the value of 18000 seconds. Yes, that's going to be my time. So that's 18000 seconds. So therefore, the energy is equal to 2.7 times by 10 to the power of 13 joules. So that's 2.7 times by 10 to the power of 13 joules. 3.5. Figure 5 shows how the UK demand for electricity increases and decreases during one day. Right, so here on the y-axis, we've got demand for electricity, and over here on the x-axis, we've got the time of day. The hydroelectric power station in figure 4 can provide 1.5 times by 10 to the power 9 watts of power for a maximum of 5 hours. Give two reasons why the hydroelectric power station is not able to meet the increase in demand between 4 and 4 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the afternoon in figure 5. So from there to there. Right, the first reason is obviously, look, this is greater than 5 hours. So obviously, um, the hydroelectric power station, hydroelectric power station can only provide for five hours, yes, but 12 is obviously required from here, yeah, and not 12, not 12 hours, good, that's the first point I'm going to make, the second point is going to be this, so look, um, we were over here, look, we're looking for the increase in the demand, so the increase is going to be from there 
to there. So what is that increase in demand from there to there? From here to over here. So, so look at this value. So this one is going to be 30 times by 10 to the power of 9. Yes, that's going to be this value of the demand electricity at this point. And over here, it's going to be roughly uh, 40, let's go for 49 times by 10 to the power of 9. The difference in the energy values, uh, let's work that out, guys. So the change in energy between both of them is going to be... So 19 times by 10 to the power of 9, that's the difference between the energy between these two points over here, top and the bottom over here. But obviously, look, the hydroelectric power station can only do 1.5. So it can't provide this 19 times 10 to the power of 9 joules of energy. So it's going to be, uh, it cannot provide the energy required, yes, uh, as demand is higher than the what it can provide, 1.5 times by 10 to the power of 9. Excellent stuff. Question four, figure six shows how much electricity was generated using coal-fired and gas-fired power stations in January for five years in the UK. So look, we've got a graph here. You've got coal and gas as the years have gone on. Uh, electricity generated in megajoules. Determine the percentage increase in electricity generated using gas-fired power stations from 2014 to 2018. So we're going from there to there. So hopefully you can see that for gas over here, we've got 3,200 over here. That's going to be this one over there. Yes. Uh, and the next one in 2018, we've got uh, 10,000, so 10,000 over here. So what is the percentage increase, everyone? So you're going to take the 10,000 minus the original, yes, divide by what it was at the start. Again, the original, 3200, zero, zero, and then we're going to times it by 100 to get a percentage, yes? So there is some maths in terms of percentages that you have to be familiar with. So from here, let's go for 10 thousand minus three two zero zero divided by three two zero zero times by a hundred I'm getting an increase a percentage increase of two hundred and twelve point five percent increase that's what I'm getting here 4.2 give two environmental advantages of using gas-fired power station to generate electricity compared to using a coal-fired power station so the first thing is going to be this if I'm going to be using a coal-fired power station it will produce sulfur dioxide so Therefore, if I use gas, I'm not going to have the sulfur dioxide being emitted. So no sulfur dioxide emissions. And another advantage is that um, with coal-fired power stations, you will have solid waste. But now with gas-fired, there's no solid waste here. So there's no solid waste. Those are the two I'm picking. There are many more for you to pick. Um, another one which I quite like is going to be Gas mining is less destructive than the coal mining. So when you're mining for the gas, it's less destructive than when you're mining for the coal. The mean surface temperature of sea changes throughout the year. A change in mean surface temperature from year to year indicates climate change. Figure 7 shows how the mean surface temperature changed between 1988 and 2016. And as you can see over here on the x-axis, we've got the years and the y-axis, we've got the temperature. A student does not believe that climate change is occurring. Explain how the data in figure 7 suggests that the student is wrong. Okay, so hopefully you can see that as the years go on, the temperature is increasing. So the first point I'm going to say is the mean surface temperature is increasing. Yes, and it's not just for one year or two years. It's going to be over a long period of time. There you go, over a long period of time. You can also put the values, maybe you can refer to, it goes from 16.45, uh, it goes all the way up to uh, 16.95, yes, or 96, actually is it 95? Yeah, 96, yeah, that is the change in temperature, that's going to be the increase. So you can either say this or over a long period of time to get the mark. Figure 8 shows how the resistance of four different thermistors A, B, C, and D varies with temperature. And as you can see, A, B, C, and D. Which of the four thermistors would be most suitable to measure the surface temperature of the C? Right, which one should I choose? Well, look, the surface temperature of the C, we're looking for the range of 16 to roughly uh, 17. So that is only the range I'm looking for. So we're looking for the thermistor which shows the greatest change. Which one is going to show the greatest change between 16 and, let's say, uh, 17 degrees. Which one shall I pick? Well, hopefully you can recognize it's going to be C. It has the greatest change between this bit here, 16 to 17. So it has the greatest change in temperature over here. So it's going to be C. The reason why is because it has the greatest change in resistance 
and we can say between, uh, you can say 16 to 17 degrees um, Celsius. Yes, obviously because that's the mean temperature change. Or you can also, they also accept between 0 and 25 degrees Celsius, which is obviously going to be the temperature uh, of the Earth's surface. Yeah, that is the maximum minimum ranges here. So you also get the mark for saying that. But you're looking at uh, this graph and you're looking at which one shows the greatest amount of change and that's going to be C. You can see that because the gradient is the steepest here. Five, radioactive waste from nuclear power stations is a man-made source of background radiation. Give one other man-made source of background radiation. Well, you can clearly say that uh, it could be CT scans or it could be, let's say, um, the fallout of nuclear weapons. So the fallout of nuclear weapons. Yeah, there's many others you can choose from as well. Right, um, nuclear power stations use the energy released by nuclear fission to generate electricity. Uh, so fission, give the name of one nuclear fuel. So I'm going to go for uranium, or they also accept plutonium. Yeah, um, either of them are fine. Um, next one, 5.3, nuclear fission releases energy. Describe the process of nuclear fission inside a nuclear reactor. Right, so if you've forgotten this process, first of all, you have one neutron hitting the uranium nucleus, and then what happens is it then becomes unstable. It splits into two smaller, lighter nuclei, and it releases energy and neutrons in that process. Let's put that all down here. So it's going to be uh, neutron fired at uranium nucleus. As it's fired at the uranium nucleus, the nucleus uh, splits into lighter nuclei. Yes, they split, become lighter nuclei, and what happens is uh, neutrons released and energy is released in the form of gamma. Figure 5.4, a new type of power station is being developed that will generate electricity using nuclear fusion. So not the same thing. Explain how the process of nuclear fusion leads to the release of energy. Right, so in nuclear fusion, you've got two lighter nuclei combined together to make a larger one, yes? And in that process, it's going to release energy. So we're gonna put that down. So fusion is when lighter nuclei, so lighter, smaller nuclei, fuse together to make a larger nucleus and releasing energy. Right, so the next mark is quite tricky. It's where is that energy coming from? Well, it's because the mass of the lighter nuclei, basically when it combines to the larger one, some of the mass is lost here. That is called the mass difference. So the mass is not the same before and afterwards. So the mass difference is then converted into energy. So the mass difference is converted into energy. 5.5, nuclear fusion power stations will produce radioactive waste. This waste will have a much shorter half-life than the radioactive waste from a nuclear fusion power station. Explain the advantage of radioactive waste having a shorter half-life. If it's a shorter half-life, is that good or bad? Right, so if it has a shorter half-life, basically that means that the activity decreases quickly. So the activity decreases quickly. Okay, that's the first thing. So the activity won't be reactive for that long. It will de the activity will decrease quickly, and therefore the amount of risk decreases. The amount of risk decreases quickly. Uh, also, the mark scheme accepts that um, allow that the burial site doesn't need to be monitored for as long, or it doesn't need to be buried underground for as long, or may not need to be buried underground. So all those ones are also acceptable with regards to the risk decreases quickly. Figure 9 shows a theme park ride called Aqua Shoot. Riders of the Aqua Shoot sit on the list sled and move down the slide. A light gate and data log are used to determine the speed of each rider and sled. What two measurements are needed to determine the speed of the rider and the sled? So obviously if you want to look at the speed, it's a distance divided by time. So it's the time over here and the length of the sled. So distance over time, that's the reason why I chose those ones for 6.1. 6.2, a decrease in the gravitational potential energy of one rider on the slide was 8.33 kilojoules. The rider moved through a vertical height of 17 meters. The gravitational field strength is 9.8. Calculate the mass of the rider. Right, so first of all, uh, the gravitational potential energy is equal to mgh. We're working out the mass, so the mass is equal to E divided by G times by H. 
the energy is going to be um, 8330, three, yes, convert that to joules, divided by gravity, 9.8, times by the height of 17 over here, I'm getting the answer of 50 kilograms. Yes, 50 kilograms. So it's rearranging that formula, plugging them in. Um, 6.3, at the bottom of the slide, all the riders and their sleds have approximately the same speed. Explain why. Right, so let's just draw it over here. Let's just let's say this is the track. So at the top, you had uh, GPE, this is the object. And then as it falls down, all the GPE gets converted into kinetic. So you had GPE at the start, and afterwards, as it falls down, it all turns back into kinetic energy. So the GP that you had then gets converted into kinetic energy as it goes downwards here. So the GPE that you had gets converted into the kinetic energy of the object. So why do they all have the same speed? Well, look, if you look at the equation, we can say that we know the gravitational potential energy, E gravitational, will be equal to the energy kinetic over here, the kinetic energy. So therefore, um, the gravitational potential energy we said was MGH. Uh, the kinetic energy is going to be a half mv squared, right? So don't forget, all that energy will be transferred here. That's why I equated both of them together. Then obviously we can see that the mass cancels out. So therefore, look, we can see that gh is equal to a half v squared. So therefore, we can see that the velocity only depends upon, so just rearranging this, this is a hard question. The velocity is equal to 2gh square rooted. So the velocity that they all end up being is only dependent upon the height and has nothing to do with the mass of the actual object itself. So it's independent of the all riders and their sleds because the velocity that you have is only dependent upon the height, the initial height that you have. So what the answer is actually looking for is the following. So, so what the answer is actually looking for is number one is that um, you get a mark for identifying this, that there's a conservation of energy here uh, because the gravitational potential energy gets converted into kinetic. The second one is for recognizing that the mass cancels out. So the mass will cancel out on both sides. That's another one. So recognizing this step over here gives you the mark. And then finally, then we get another mark for saying that the final speed, uh, so the final speed depends on gravity. So look, only on gravity and height. Gravity and height. Right, so the reason why it has approximately the same speed, so why are they, some of them might be a little bit different and not, not you know, perfectly the same, it's because obviously we have ignored air resistance and friction, and therefore we can put down the small variations, so small variations due to air resistance and friction. There we go, so small variations due to air resistance and friction. Easy stuff. Question seven, an electric kettle was switched on. Figure 10 shows how the temperature of the water inside the kettle changed. There we go, so we've got temperature over here, degrees Celsius, time after the kettle was switched on in seconds. When the kettle was switched on, the temperature of the water did not immediately start to increase. So just one reason why. So why did it increase straight away? Why is there a gap here? Well, obviously it's going to be, it takes time for the kettle to heat up. So it takes time for heating element to heat up. Yeah, that's inside the kettle, or it takes time for the kettle to heat up. Uh, 7.2, the energy transferred to the water in 100 seconds was 155,000 joules. Specific heat capacity is 420 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Determine the mass of the water in the kettle. Right, so first of all, uh, we're going for, we need to work out the mass of the water. So well, I know it's going to be the energy is equal to the mass times by the specific heat capacity times by the temperature change. What was the temperature change? So first, let's look at the temperature change in this one. In the 100 seconds, it goes from 22. So that's my initial temperature, 22 degrees Celsius. And it goes up to 100 degrees Celsius. So the change from there is going to be 78. So therefore, we know that the temperature change, everyone, is going to be 78 degrees Celsius. Uh, now, from here, let's go rearrange it to make matter subject. M is equal to E divided by C delta theta. So the energy is equal to 155000 divided by specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity is given to us as 4200 times by 78. We're getting the answer of 0 0.4731. That's going to be my answer. That's the mass of the water, but to 2SF, 0.47 kg. Don't forget to 2SF, guys. 
Right, next one, 7.3. The straight section of the line in figure 10 can be used to calculate the useful power output of the kettle. Explain why. Okay, so to answer this question, we've got to revisit the graph from before. Right, so looking at this graph right now, the straight bit over here, how can we use that to work out the power? How can we use that to work out the power? Right, so first of all, we need to look at the gradient. The gradient of this is the change in y. So the gradient of this line is equal to the change in y over the change in x. The change in the y values is the temperature, so it's the change in temperature divided by the time. Change in temperature divided by time taken. Okay, okay, so how does this link to power? Well, hopefully you can recognize that power is equal to energy divided by time. So the power times by time is equal to the energy. Okay, right, the energy was obviously going to be the energy due to the specific heat capacity, which is therefore power times by time is equal to mc delta theta. Right, okay, there we go. Now, if I then were to do the following, if I was to bring the T underneath here, we then have power uh, is equal to MC, the change in temperature divided by time taken. Okay, so that clearly we can see it's this, it is the gradient. So therefore, from this bit, we can say that the power is equal to the mass times by the specific heat capacity times by the gradient of this line over here. So that's how we can work out the power. So what the mark scheme is looking for is going to be identifying that, uh, number one, that the gradient uh, is going to be uh, this bit over here, recognizing the gradient is this, delta theta over t. You get one mark for also saying that power times by time is equal to the energy transferred. Yeah, so this one over here. So therefore, mc delta theta, this is another mark. And the last mark is for saying that uh, this one over here, the power is equal to the mass times by the specific heat capacity times by the gradient over here. Excellent stuff. Eight, a student investigated how the total resistance of identical resistors connected in parallel varied with the number of resistors. The student used an ohmmeter to measure the total resistance of the resistors. Figure 11 shows the student circuit with three resistors. One, two, three. The student repeated each reading of resistance three times. Table one shows some of the results for three resistors in parallel. So there we go, table one, you've got three resistors, reading one, reading two, reading three, and there's the mean. Calculate the value of x, right, it's just a bit of maths here. So to work out the mean, it's 15.8 plus 13.3 plus x uh, divided by three, that will give you the mean of 15.7. So then rearranging this, guys, uh, to make x the subject, so uh, 15.8 plus 13.3 plus x is equal to three times by 15.7. Okay, so the next line, guys, so 3 times by 15.7, so 3 times by 15.7, I'm getting 47.1. And the other one is going to be 15.8 plus 15.3, I'm getting the answer of 31.1 plus x over here. So finally then, x is equal to uh, 47.1 uh, subtracting 31.1. I'm getting the value of x to be 16. So the value of x over here is going to be 16. 16 is my answer for x. 8.2, the student thought that the fourth reading would improve the precision of the results. The fourth reading was 16.2 ohms. Explain why the student was wrong. So this question is actually asking about what does the word precise mean? Precise means that the results are close together. Right, so originally he had, um, 15.8, uh, 15.3, and 16. So it originally had 15.8, 15.3, and 16. Okay, so right, these ones are quite precise because they're close together. But what happens now if I was to put 16.2 as the fourth result? Are they close together or not? Well, the key thing is going to be this. This 16.2 makes it less precise. So um, the fourth result, so the fourth result is less precise, is less precise. The fourth result is less precise here, because look, it's further away from the mean. And obviously they want to test your ability to understand what precision means. Precise simply means, so precise means uh, little variation, little variation. Uh, so that's the reason why it's less precise. So logically, look, if I had these three results, this is more precise than having four, because four, they're further away from each other. Next one, figure 12 shows the results from the investigation. So the mean total resistance in ohms, number of resistors in parallel. 
The student concluded that the number of resistors in parallel was inversely proportional to the mean total resistance. Explain why the student was correct. Use data from figure 12 in your answer. Right, so this question is about inverse proportionality. So it's trying to say that the resistance is going to be inversely proportional to the number of resistors. Number of resistors. Okay, over here. So they're trying to be um, inversely proportional to each other. Okay, so if you want to check this, what you're going to do is the following. So let's just say R is proportional to 1 over N. So I'm just calling this bit R. I'm calling this bit N over here. So N is going to be the number of resistors. So therefore in maths, R is equal to a constant. So any constant, there we go, K divided by N. Right, so if I were to take any value of the resistance times by the value of N, it will be equal to a constant. That constant will be the same at different points. So the value of K will be the same at different points. So if I take values of um, R and N from here, time them together, and I do it from there and there, they will all give me the same value for K. So let's do it. So for the first one, uh, we can work it out. Okay, so let's do this. Let's take multiple values and work out the constant for each of them. So look, for this one over here, it's 24. So R is going to be 24. So R is, so if I take 24 for R and look, I times it by N, N is two. What's that value going to be? I'm going to get 48. All right, let's try another one. Let's go for, uh, let's go uh, three. Yes, so three is going to be the value of N. Uh, the value of the other one is 16, R is 16. I'm getting the value of 48 again. Look, the constant is the same. See, that constant is the same each time. And let's do it again, guys, for the fourth one. Let's say they take the fourth one over here. So the value of R for the fourth one, it's going to be 12. So look, that reading is 12 on R times by four. That is also going to be 48 over here. So look, the constant is the same for each one of them. So taking different pairs, I'm able to say that the constant is the same for each one and therefore we know it's true. So in the mark scheme guys, you get one mark for using two pairs. So these two will be one mark. You get another mark for this one over here. And therefore the last mark is for saying that uh, N times by R is equal to a constant and which is going to be true. So therefore the student is true. Therefore the student is correct. The student is correct. 8.4, explain why adding resistors in parallel decreases the total resistance. Right, if you have forgotten, um, let's go back to the question that's right at the start. So always review the question, go right back to the question at the start uh, over here. So why is it that when you add them in parallel, there is this resistance? Well, think about this. Yeah, um, let's just say, fine, let's just say we had one resistor over here. You have to, all of you have to pass through it. Yes, yeah? so you've got one traffic jam. So imagine this as a traffic jam. All of you have to pass through the traffic jam. But if you've got, let's say, the two of them in parallel now, look, therefore, some of you can go for the top, some of you can go for the bottom one. So there's less resistance right now. And obviously, if you were to just keep doing it, let's say you add another one over here, uh, let's say there's three of them in parallel, right? What happens is you're able to, you're able to pass through that much easily than the first one because there are three different routes for you to take here. So the mark scheme is looking for, there are multiple paths, so there are multiple paths for current to flow, and therefore the total current is greater. So therefore the total current is greater. Nine, figure 13 shows part of a main electricity lighting circuit in a house. Neutral wire, lamp, the live wire. A fault in the switch caused a householder to receive a mild electric shock before the safety device switch the circuit off. The mean power transfer to the person was 5.75 watts. The potential difference across the person was 230 volts. Calculate the mean resistance of the person. Right, calculate the mean resistance of the person. Okay, so right, so this is a two-step calculation. So if I want to work at the resistance, I know that V is equal to I times by R. So R is equal to V divided by I. So if I know the voltage and divide it by the current, I'll get the resistance but I don't have the current straight away. So I've got to work out the current using a second equation. Power is equal to current times by voltage over here. So the current is equal to the power divided by the voltage. So the power I had was 5.75 divided by the voltage 230. I'm getting the current going to be equal to 0.025. That's going to be the current. Therefore, we can then plug it into the resistance here. So R is equal to V. The value of V is going to be 230 divided by the current I worked out, 0.025. I'm getting the value of the resistance going to be 9200 ohms over here.
9.2, an electrician replaced the switch. The electrician would have received a shock unless the circuit was disconnected from the main supply. Explain why. Right, if you look at the diagram from before, so if you look at this diagram over here, one of them, look, the, the live wire has a potential difference of 230 volts, yes? And obviously, the person is earthed. So if the person, let's just draw the person over here, the person is going to be earthed. So you are earthed. So you, that means you have zero volts over here. So one of the wires is 230 volts. You have zero volts. So therefore, the reason why you receive a shock is because there is a large potential difference between the live wire and yourself. That's the reason why you obtain the shock. So first of all, we can say one wire uh, is live, uh, which has 230 volts. Second part is we're saying that the person is earthed, which therefore means it has zero volts. And finally, the last one is going to be, uh, therefore, there is a large potential difference between them. Hence, they receive a shock. So don't forget, the reason why you have a shock is because there's a large potential difference between the person and the live wire. 9.3, the current from an electric shock causes a person's muscles to contract. The person cannot let go of the electrical circuit if the current is too high. Figure 14 shows how the maximum current at which a person can let go depends on the frequency of electricity supply. Right, so the maximum current which a person can let go over here the UK mains frequency is 50 hertz. Explain why it would be safer if the UK mains frequency is not 50 hertz. So explain why the UK's mains frequency is not 50 hertz over here. Okay, so this is one of the trickiest questions in the actual paper. So it's all about understanding what this means. This means that it's the maximum current which a person can let go of the wire. So if it's 50 hertz, the maximum current over here is going to be nine milliamps. That is the maximum current. So therefore, if you reach 9 milliamps, you can't let go of the wire. So it's quite dangerous. So therefore, uh, just to give you some ideas, so that means that if you were 7 milliamps at 50 hertz, you can let go. If you were 8 milliamps at 50 hertz, you can let go. So therefore, 8 milliamps, you are safe. 7 milliamps, you are also safe. Uh, but let's just say, for example, we looked at um, 100, 100 hertz. At 100 hertz, the maximum is going to be 16 milliamps over here. It's 16 milliamps over here. So therefore, at 16 milliamps, if you were at that value, you can't let go of the wire. But look, it means that you can hold on to the wire when it's 10 milliamps then. It's fine. So 10 milliamps isn't 16 yet. So therefore, it is a better option for you. So the key thing is going to be that the higher the maximum current, the safer it is for you. So let's put that down here. So the first thing point I'm going to make is that uh, 50 hertz has the lowest let go value, lowest let go current. And the next point I'm going to make is that at a higher frequency, we know that the let go current will be higher, will be higher and therefore, and therefore people will be able to let go at a greater current. I hope that makes sense. So look, at 50 hertz, it's nine milliamps, which is the maximum, and you're stuck, you have, you're stuck on the wire, you can't let go of it. But look, at 100 uh, hertz, you can go up to 60 milliamps, and you can still let go of the wire. So you want it to be as high as possible for it to be safer for you. Question 10, figure 15 shows a balloon filled with helium gas. Which statements describe the movement of the gas particles in the balloon? So first of all, it's going to be going to move in random directions and a range of speeds. So random direction and a range of speeds. Next one is going to be the pressure of the helium in the balloon is 100,000 Pascal. The volume is 0.03 meter cube. The balloon is compressed at constant temperature. Work out the new pressure, right? This is P1 times by V1 is equal to P2 times by V2. Therefore, uh, the final pressure, P2 is equal to P1 V1 divided by V2. So the pressure initially is 100,000 times by 0.03. Uh, then I'm going to divide that by the new volume, 0.025. I'm getting the value of 120,000 Pascal over here. 
The temperature of the helium in the balloon was increased. The mass and the volume of the helium in the balloon remained constant. Explain why the pressure exerted by the helium inside the balloon would increase. What is going to happen? Right, so the key thing is going to have the particles gain kinetic energy. So the particles gain kinetic energy energy and when they gain kinetic energy they collide with the walls more often so there are more collisions per second with the wall and therefore there's greater forces so therefore greater forces acting per unit area greater forces uh, acting on the walls and then last of all then therefore there's a greater force per acting per unit area greater force acting per unit area and hence why the pressure increases and that's it for another session of surrounds dazzle physics make sure you hit the like subscribe button to keep my channel going and good luck in your academic studies ciao ciao and goodbye